this is Jack Jackson. Today we're going to be looking at exponential functions graphed by sliders. When you open up this GeoGebra applet, you'll see um, a graph here, and you'll see some parameters, C, K, and A, that are controlled by these sliders here in the upper right corner of the um, window there, of the graphing window. And we're going to be looking at formulas uh, that look like f of x equals a plus c times e to the power kx. And we can change these. Now, k is our exponential rate of growth, or our compound continuous rate of growth, our continuous growth rate, which is a relative rate, a percentage rate. It turns out that e to the k is our base, if we write it as just a plus c times b to the x power. The b there is e to the k power. Also, the base is 1 plus r, so r is the base minus 1, which is going to be, um, and then r is the relative rate of growth uh, in a periodic sense. So, if you're going at a certain percent per month, if time is in months, then the R is that percentage growth. It would be in a decimal form, of course. Now, if you look over here in the spreadsheet part of the, of the uh, window, you will see the values of A, C, and K All right, that are controlled by the parameters. Then you'll see a computed value for B, and if you notice at the moment, B is approximately 2, K is approximately 0.7, and R is approximately 1. So B is e to the k, and you can see a value. So these, these values here for, for uh, B, and, B and R, that are, uh, they're actually computed. These values for A, C, and K are controlled uh, by these parameters up here, by the sliders. So the formula in the original form is y equals 1 times e to the point 7x. And here we see x and y values in the... Uh, table that you see down here. And so we can see some values for x and y have the integers from negative 8 to 8 for the inputs and you can see the outputs. Now these are rounded off so things go a little bit differently. So for example if this were 2 then you double it, uh, the base is 2 so this would be 2, 4, 8, 16. It's not exactly 2. It's a little bit over, so they're not exactly on. And every time we go down one, we're dividing roughly by 2, but at some point we're, we're rounding off to two places everywhere here. So we get definitely some approximations there. So let's take a look at what we see over here in the graph as we change our parameter k. So as k gets larger, the graph's going to grow faster and faster here. we get a negative k, we go the other direction. So I've, I'm able to, with this slider, I can change k for all the way from negative 2 to 2. There's from negative, uh, decreasing by 200% up to increasing by 200%. Now, of course, when k is 0, there is a spot in the middle where this degenerates. Where k is 0, and I don't know if I get it exactly on it or not, I think I can. Yeah, and then of course you just get y equals 1, or y equals c, which is your uh, a horizontal line. So that's not truly a, an exponential. But when k is a positive, we have exponential growth. Notice it's increasing concave up. But when we switch over to k is negative, it's, uh, it's like it's flipped over the y-axis, so it's, in, it's decreasing, still concave up, but decreasing. The closer k is to 0, the flatter it is, and the further k is away from 0, the, um, the more pronounced that curvature is. Okay. Now, let's, uh, let's continue just, just manipulating k only, and look over here in the table a minute, and look what happens when I change the value of k. As k increases, so does both b and r. 
when k is 0, then, we, uh, then k and r are the same thing. They're both 0. Let's put it at 0 there. So k and r are both 0 at the same time. That means you don't have any growth or decay. So it's just level, constant function. But now as we increase k, uh, r increases as well. So here they look, they round off at least to both the same thing, 0 0.01. They're not exactly the same. But as I get a little bit bigger, as I get further away, we just start to see some deviation. K and R are pretty close to each other uh, now. But as we get a little bit bigger, we see that they're a little different. So K is 0.11, uh, R is 0.12. So here we see that at least rounding off to two decimal places, um, when K is 11%, R is 12%. And so the further they get away from zero, the further these deviate from each other. So here we have K is 18% and R is 20%. So K and R are not the same thing, um, but they're, if they're close to zero, they're going to be, if it's zero, they're going to be the same. And as you deviate from zero, they get further and further apart from each other. But notice when K is positive, R is positive, and it's in the same ballpark, you might say. So they're fairly close to each other, but not exactly the same thing. Uh, in a sense, they measure the same thing. R is a percentage rate of growth. K is a percentage rate of growth. But the difference is R is your periodic rate of growth, and K is your continuous rate of growth. So what this is saying here, for example, is if you're growing at 25% uh, compounded continuously, that's approximately the same thing as 28% compounded annually. Okay, so 28% actually figuring it out growth on the on a yearly basis is the same as 25% figuring out uh, growing at a continuous basis. Okay, notice the base is always 1 plus R. So notice when K is positive, the base is bigger than 1 and R is positive, and that's exactly when you get exponential growth and that happens for all these values here look at the uh, look at both the, the values of B and R and also at the graph anytime you have a positive K you're going to get growth now anytime you have a negative K uh, we're going to get uh, decay so now notice again when K is 0 R and K are the same and the further you get away from 0 uh, even when we go to the left R and K kind of follow each other, but not exactly right on. So, for example, here, by the time we get out to negative uh, 13%, or a DK rate of 13%, um, compound, continuously, a continuous rate of 13% DK, that corresponds to a 12% uh, per X period uh, rate of growth, or decay, actually, here. And notice that also corresponds to a base less than 1. So when K is negative, R is negative, and B is less than 1, and that's when we get the decay here. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, let's just pick something, let's say 0 0.54K. Now, let's look what happens when we change some of these other values. Let's change the value of C. C can be thought of a couple of ways. Uh, probably the easiest way to see it is as a vertical stretch or, or compression. And so, when C is 1, then, then the, uh, gra and, and A is 0, it's going to go through, the, uh, the graph is going to go through the point zero, 1, so it's going to cross the y-axis at zero, 1. Notice as I change K, that's the one point that doesn't move. See it right there on the x-axis, 0, 1. I mean on the y-axis, excuse me, 0, 1. It does not move. Okay? So that point on the y-intercept doesn't move. But when I change C, it does move. It actually stretches the thing. Notice this is not changing the asymptote. Let's do one where, where the asymptote's on the right, a decay function. Notice that the horizontal asymptote is staying the same, but changing the value of C. Oops, I'm supposed to be changing the value of C, not K. Let's put it. Uh, okay, say there. Let's see. There 
There we go. Let's put it there. Let's change this to about negative 0.7 roughly. Okay. Alright, so if we put it there, let's look at what happens when we change C. Now, C is going to give us a vertical stretch. So if C is 2, instead of going through 0, 1, now it goes through 0, 2. So if C is uh, 2.5, now it goes through 0, 2.5. So notice what we've done is we're changing the y-intercept when we do this. And so um, if, if the A is 0, then that C is y sub 0. And notice that we're giving a, a stretch to it. It actually turns out this can also be thought of as a horizontal shift as well. But let me put it at 3, for example. Now what happens with A? Well, A is no surprise. The whole thing is a vertical shift. So, for example, if A is 1, notice we shifted it up. And notice that, that this one actually shifts up the uh, horizontal asymptote as well. So now y equals, <coughs> y equals a is the asymptote. Okay. Now notice if c is positive, the graph is completely above the asymptote. Of course, if c is 0, then the whole thing is just becomes a, a constant function. It kind of degenerates, so we're not going to use c as 0. But if we have a negative c, notice that now it's flipped over so that it stays below the, the uh, asymptote. So all these negative values here for, for, C, uh, for, for, for C, no matter what K is, that keeps it below the as, asymptote. And all these negative values here for C keep it below. When C goes positive, now the graph is above the asymptote. Okay? So here C is negative. Notice when K is positive, the asymptote's on the left, whether C is positive or negative. And when K is negative, the asymptote's on the right. Again, whether C is positive or negative. And the value of A gives our vertical shift of the whole thing. Okay, and you can follow what's happening with the Y values in the table as well. Okay, and you can look at that over here if you want as well. So some of this is summarized here. There are at least three good forms that we can use. Y equals A plus C times E to the power of parentheses KX. Y equals A plus C times B to the X. Or Y equals A plus C times 1 plus R to the X. And the basically relationship is B equals 1 plus R, which is the same thing as R equals B minus 1. And E to the K equals B, which is the same as K equals natural log of B. The y-intercept is 0, comma A plus C. It our graph always approaches a horizontal asymptote of y equals a, but only on one end, one end or the other. If c is positive, the graph is entirely above the horizontal asymptote, and if c is negative, the graph is entirely below the horizontal asymptote. So when c is positive, the, the range is a to infinity, not including a. And if c is negative, the range is negative infinity to a, but not including a. The absolute value of C can be thought of as either two ways, a, a vertical strain, so an expansion or compression by a factor of absolute value of C, or it can be thought as a horizontal translation by the natural logarithm of the absolute value of C. If K is positive, then R is positive and B is po greater than 1, and the graph will approach the horizontal asymptote on the far left. If the K is negative, then R is between negative 1 and 0, and B is between 0 and 1, and the graph will approach a horizontal asymptote on the far right. And you can kind of verify all those things. I think we already did in our exploration here, but you should open this yourself and experiment with it, these sliders and see if you can make sure that you have a really good understanding of the relationship of K, B, and R, and also the effect of A, C, and K on the graph, or the effect of uh, notice if you're changing K, you're changing B and R. Any one of those three changes the other two because they depend on each other. So that should give you a pretty good idea of what graphs of exponential functions look like even when we do some transformations to them.